Welcome to the International Schools Podcast. I'm your co-host, John Micton, and Dan is on holiday this week, but we'll be back next week. You know, over the last 18 months on the podcast, we've had all kinds of different guests, and we always learn so much from our guests. And one of the topics, of course, has been the whole AI narrative. And a lot of the conversations have been very high level about the ethics and how this is changing schools. What's the value added of a school now that kids can answer questions using chat GPT? And there's just a whole host of questions and uh, reflections that we have been exploring with guests and all over social media and in the education sphere, there have been a lot of conversations, you know, guidelines, policy, uh, you know, when is it appropriate, not appropriate, uh, the whole cheating thing, you know, do exams, do we throw exams out? What does assessment look like in the age of AI? But today we're going to really go down to what I would kind of like to use the term the ground level into the trenches and basically into the classroom. And I feel very privileged because today I have three educators that really, in my personal opinion, who I have been watching uh, through social media, have really been leading and, and innovating at a level where it's very uh, grounded, it's very down to earth, it's really thinking about what it's like to be a teacher in the classroom. And that's Corey Yang, who's a technology coach and NYP design teacher at Renaissance College in Hong Kong. Dalton Flanagan, who's learning and innovation at Chinese International School focused on primary. And James Wilson, who's a PBL coordinator, individuals and society teacher, also at uh, Chinese International School, focusing more on the uh, middle and high school. So today we're going to kind of spend some time thinking about the classroom, you know, dispositions, approaches, what are the tools that really resonate? What are some things maybe teachers need to be mindful of in regard to those tools and some tips and strategies? So all three of you, thank you so much. And what I'm going to do is straight away kick off, and I'm going to ask Cora maybe to kick off, is... <clears throat> When we think of all these AI tools, and there are a lot of them coming online, I mean, ChatGPT, BARD, uh, Claude are kind of the, what I would say the big ones that really get a lot of press. But a lot of education companies now are leveraging uh, the APIs that you can get from ChatGPT and Gemini. So really leveraging that technology to create their own indigenous type of AI tool. What do you think are the dispositions and kind of the approaches? If I'm a teacher about to enter this, what are some things that you've noticed supporting the teachers in your school? And also the work that all three of you do presenting at conferences and in different education forums. What are the dispositions? We'll go to Cora, then James and Dalton. So Cora, disposition, some reflections on that. I find it, I've... So I find, because I did a survey like a year ago, ask a lot of teachers what's their opinions towards to AI. And it turned out it was really interesting. At least 80% of teachers, they said that they feel scared of that because they feel like it's unknown. It's something new. They had, they back to that time, like people had no idea where this is going to go and how it's going to look like. But which is quite a natural because we're just afraid of unknown stuff and we're afraid of new stuff. That's probably part of the human nature. But I think one thing I find it's very helpful when you introduce AI, especially from practical perspective, is to find like an easy to use tools or we can call it like low floor, high ceiling tools. And this tools, it's more versatile. It could apply to a lot of different subject teachers, especially when it comes to the practical use in classrooms. And also teachers can play around. They can easy to grab it to see the instant outcome. And meanwhile, they can play around, they can make it even better. So because Hong Kong, we have um, regional restrictions. So we use poll quite a lot. And with the poll, you can create a chatbot. With a chatbot, it's so easy for you to create something really easy, but meanwhile, it's such versatile tool um different subject teachers can use it in different ways and can apply to all of their subject contents 
Thank you. So, yeah, I think, you know, it's interesting that you surveyed people and there was kind of this fear and unknown. And I think the unknown is always challenging in any context, be it AI or when you're as an educational educator, you're <clears throat> going to a new location, a new school, a new job. The unknown is the uncertainty is what makes it a little difficult. We as human beings like routine. We like to know what's going to happen. And I think as educators, we might have a heightened need for that because when we're dealing with many kids in the the classroom, you kind of want to be in control to make sure you can move forward. James, your thoughts on that disposition? Uh, yeah, when you first mentioned this this term, I thought it's, an, thought it's an interesting one, and it's one that I hadn't thought about the dispositions of a teacher for this. Um, so you, you've made me think about it, and I, I jotted down a couple of notes. Um, one and you know something that I've noticed at um, at Chinese International School and and I would expect it would be the same at, at schools around the world um, is it it there's no kind of age bracket for this um, teachers of all ages um, can jump into it or be afraid of it so that's one thing that I've noticed for sure but I would say a lifelong learner um, that would be one disposition that I think is a great asset for this is just really being open to um to to learning new things that's that's a, that's a trait that i definitely notice in the teachers that have kind of taken this forward um linked to that i would say a curiosity that the curiosity and, and openness about things um there's a certain spirit of play um that's involved in all of this because it is such a new thing and we're all in this kind of sandbox together and you and you have to be comfortable um, and embrace that in a way, and that maybe even getting into a little bit of like, you know, comfort with ambiguity in some sense, because a lot of this stuff is uncertain. And and the last thing that I that I was thinking about, I had grit, but maybe it's resilience. Um, but a lot of these things take time. Um, even you know, we talk about prompt engineering and things like that. A lot of these things to get good at it, it's it it does take time. Um, and so you have to uh, you have to have, I think, some you know, perseverance, let's say, um, and, and a willingness to kind of um, keep at it. But th those are some of the dispositions that when I look at, you know, fellow educators that have really kind of taken it forward, those would be some that really stand out. It's so interesting because a lot of the dispositions you describe are dispositions people would want to engage in any change process. Uh, mm -hmm. And a lot of these dispositions are what many of our school missions are based. The idea of resilience, you know, adaptability, long life learning. Mm -hmm. So it's just wonderful how you're echoing that and really highlighting them so nicely as very distinctive, uh, almost toolkits, you know, mindsets that you mm -hmm. have to come into. Thank you, James, for mm -hmm. that. Dalton. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, dispositions. We've put out a survey recently because we recently did um, like a PD for educators at our school and on AI. And um, one thing I saw a lot is teachers wanted time to explore, to play around with it. Um, because I can echo what Cora said and what James were saying. There, there's that fear of the unknown. And also things are changing really quickly. So it's hard to keep on top of all the changes and, and what's the best uh, LLL or uh, large language model out there right now. Um, the ways we're, we're trying to put teachers' minds at ease or trying to reach them is like starting with like maybe the basics, like somebody mentioned prompting, start easy with um, how you get good feedback from a prompt um, and being specific and giving the AI a role, things like that. Some of the fear that we're seeing around AI is not new to technology coaches though, right? I mean, <laughs> when new technology comes out, you always have to oh, be aware of where's the data going. I mean, AI is not the first um, technology to be to be using data. I mean, Google is using our is using our data and other ones as well. Um, and yeah, so so in some sense, uh, we can we can look at how we helped teachers feel comfortable with technology in the past whether it was like the first time we introduced laptops or one-to-one -one iPads, things like that, and, and what worked there. And so, yeah, I think starting off small with like projects that you know will be successful or that you know um, the teacher will see the benefit or the time saver, time saving um, way to use the, the product or the, the AI model, I think that's, that's one way that we're, we're dealing with that fear, I think. 
And what's interesting, uh, Dalton, is the idea that you're using some of the tr strategies that you use. You mentioned one-to-one -one laptop, iPads. So a lot of technology often comes, <clears throat> is received initially with some apprehension and fear. And it's nice to see that some of those techniques that uh, digital learning coaches, tech facilitators have used are transferable today in the context of AI. And I think that's really, it's because we're talking about change and the word change is really the focus. The AI is the tool as the laptop or the iPad was. Thank you for that. So James, mm -hmm. one of the questions that I'd like to ask you guys is the mechanics. So are you know, most AI tools, and, and we're not going to get into terms because I think hopefully by now people know that there's generative AI, large language models, and I would say most of what we're talking about are these large language models that also worked with text, image, voice, and video. But are there some basic principles? Do they all work? So if I'm working with one tool as a teacher, and then I say, oh, there's another one. Is there a lot of transferable mechanical knowledge between these different AIs? Have you found there's a certain kind of baseline that you have to walk into with these tools? Um, I, I would say if there is a kind of a, um, no, I would say there's some variance and, and part of that variance comes in how, in how teachers use them. I mean, where, where there would be a, baseline is if teachers are say for example using the the po suite of um of of ai of ai bots um there i suppose that there would be you know certain mechanics in terms of you know the the uh the prompting involved to get responses um but once you once you venture out from that um and you're using different sorts of ai tools for different purposes for example um conducting research um or reading comprehension um then um some of the yeah i would say some of the you know the, the functions would be would be different in in that way um yeah so so it, a, a baseline would um yeah i i would I would think prompt engineering. This would be something I would be very curious to see how how Dalton responds to this one and Cora being more kind of familiar with the back end. But from my perspective, um, there are we're still at a place where there's a kind of an overload of, of various apps that that teachers use for different functions. Um, and if there's one kind of um, landing page, I, I would say that would that would be Poe for the moment, at least where, where we are. Okay, and I just think uh, Poe is a large language model chatbot, and it's uh, mm. I, we many people use Bard and ChatGPT, so it works mm. on the same principle. And I know mm. there's the iPhone app. Dalton, please jump in. Yeah, um, I was gonna say Poe's slightly different because what it is is a platform where you're able to interact with a number of these different large language models. Exactly. So you're able to um, write prompts and send it to um, GPT-4 if you're paying for Poe, or you're able to write prompts and send it to GPT-3.5 uh, for the free version. And they do also allow access to Claude and um, Stable Diffusion. And uh, I think Llama and a few other, uh, uh, actually a number of other models as well. So in many ways, it's like an AI aggregator. In other words, it's like uh, years ago, there was a search engine called Dogpile, which was a meta search engine. So when you searched in Dogpile, it actually went to Alta Vista, Lycra, all these ones that don't exist anymore. But <clears throat> that's kind of the same idea. Dalton, so, you know, do you think uh, in, in response to James' uh, response, is there, do you agree with this baseline, but they're all very different? Yeah, it's an interesting question, and I think there'd be some skills that would be transferable. I was thinking when I when you're asking that question, I was thinking, okay, well, like the the way they work when you're doing like a text to image um, model is a lot different than the when the way it works with, with a text to text um, generation model, like the large language model. But there are some things that you'd want to be specific when prompting if you wanted to get good, if you wanted to get like a good result. So things like that, I guess, could transfer maybe against across all of them. If we're talking about like just the large language models and that'd be like the text generation, um, like GPT-4 or Claude, then those would be quite similar, I think. And 
one thing that I like about that interface is that it's in a chat format. So you put in a prompt and you, hopefully it's a good prompt. Hopefully uh, you get back what you want. But if for some reason you didn't get back from what you get back exactly what you wanted, it, it's in a chat format. So you can just come back to it and say, you know what, can you give it to me in a more professional tone or can you do the same lesson, but maybe differentiate it? Uh, so there is that room to um, improve your prompt as you're going around in that chat format. So um, that's one thing that you that would work across the most of the large language models, I believe. Excellent. Cora. I um I don't know. I feel like this is such an interesting question. I've never thought about this, but now while everybody was answering, it gave me a little bit of time to think about it. I do think there are a lot of things common while coming to use different tools, um, especially the prompt crafting skills, because you have to give specific instructions, and the better your skill is at the prompt and um, crafting the prompts the better results you probably will get. So I think this is skills so far with most of the available tools we have it, it's by giving instruction, giving prompts. Um, and I really echo what James mentioned about it because there are so many tools right now, like every day you just wake up and you find there are new tools about AI and so overwhelming. But I think in some way, it's very similar to other ad tech tools, any tools, because this is such a trend, like buzz, everybody's talking about it. So that's why it's so popular. Everybody focus on this and, you know, just so many tools. But what we really need when you find some core like platform or tools, we can use a focus on it, really use it. And uh, I know that a lot of people have been talking about a lot of the platform like Magic School AI and the School AI. And the one thing why they stand out from my personal perspective, because they kind of, it's like, like a pole, it's a platform where it has the collection of different things. So you don't have to jump among different tools. So you just use it within one thing. So I think, it's quite important. It's like, especially from ad tech perspective, you do not want to introduce so much information, so many tools to teachers, especially they have their busy schedule already. So what we need, we need to filter what's the best tool for them and to focus on this core apps or core tools and introduce to that. Um, I think that that's quite important. So yeah, it's I, also over very overwhelming for myself. Like every day I just find <laughs> that new tools. I couldn't really catch up with that. I, I agree. You know, I subscribe to a bunch of AI newsletters, superhuman AI, AI tools, and <clears throat> I, I just can't keep up. And uh, I agree. And I think your point's an important one is when you're working with teachers is kind of really narrow it down to a few tools because the reality of any teacher in a classroom, the day is super busy, huge responsibility uh, having students in front of you and being a carer and, and really, you know, the nuances that come with every different child and differentiating. And then on top of that, everything else that a school requires, be it extracurricular activities or there's a new platform you're adopting or maybe a new curriculum. So I think, you know, I'm going to turn to Dalton. What are some things, how to manage this time as a teacher? What are you suggesting or what are you seeing that works well? And then, of course, all three of you have talked about prompting. So we've got the time and then very likely the next step is Okay, I've got the time, I've got the tool, now I have to prompt. So maybe navigate us through that from your experience working with teachers, Dalton. You know, how do you find the time and what is it about prompting people should be mindful of? Oh, great. Um, how do you find the time? Yeah, that's that's hard. Um, that's the one thing that, went, that came out of that survey that we did recently. People wanted time to explore and, the, and yeah, they're it feels almost impossible to stay on top of everything. I really enjoy it. I'm uh, ever since Stable Diffusion came out, I've been kind of hooked with these generative AI models and I love digging into it. So you mentioned some of the people, some of the newsletters that that you're receiving and, and those are familiar to me. And there's also a few YouTube channels that I like. There's one called AI Explained and One Little Coder. And there's um, the Hard Fork podcast. I think yes, it's, excellent. Uh, yeah, from the New York Times, it's, it's really amazing. Well, I enjoy that. So for me, it, it's easy for me. But I, if I was talking to 
Um, one of the teachers at my school, I'd want them to find something that they enjoy. Maybe that's a podcast. Maybe it's a YouTube channel that helps them stay up to date. Or maybe it's just playing around with um, text to image. That's where I started when Stable Diffusion uh, first came out. I was putting in um, text prompts and it was it felt to me like slightly like gambling, right? Because you didn't know what you were going to get and you're really excited to see um, what this AI model was going to create. And I had never seen anything like it back then. And Dalton, then, can um, you explain stable diffusion to audience members that might not be familiar with it? Because I think uh, that's helpful because not we just can't assume everybody knows it, if you don't mind. No, no, no problem. Um, stable diffusion is an open source text to image diffusion model. So it works the same um, way that Dolly 3 would be working from OpenAI. Um, and there, there's a few other ones as well, but you put in a text prompt and you get back an image. And it came out right before um, uh, GPT uh, 3.5 came out. So it was, um, and I remember one of my friends shared it with me early on, uh, this librarian that I used to work with, Tarn, and he would, uh, he shared it with me. And it, I remember staying up at night and uh, just putting in text prompts to see what, what I could get back. Because uh, it was kind of mind blowing for me that, that what it could create, um, being able to see a new universe imagined by Salvador Dali or something. It's just, it, it ha I hadn't um, imagined technology like that because it's a big shift the way computers are learning to think and be becoming smarter. Uh, and yeah, in, in simulating the human mind, right? It, it's it's a pretty incredible shift. So that so that stable diffusion, that's one of the things that got me hooked. And talk to um, us about the prompting, uh, Dalton. You know, the prompting. When you work with teachers, prompting is really important. You all mentioned that if you have a good prompt, you get a good return. There's the chat messaging component. So you prompt, and maybe the return is not that great, and you go back in, make it more, as you said, make it more professional, or maybe differentiate, as you had mentioned too. What What are you telling teachers about prompting? Uh, um, well, Cora helped me make like a little poster that I could share with the teachers. And it's, I use an acronym called CREATE. Um, so the acronym's just kind of like a checklist to remember the different um, elements to include in a prompt. But the C in CREATE would stand for context, because while these large language models, they have a, like a large reference, they have a, a large knowledge base, they don't have a context. They don't know exactly where you're coming from. So the more context you can add, that's usually helpful. Um, the R in create stands for role. So again, if you give it a role, it knows um, it's, it understands the context a little bit more. The E is for examples. You don't always need examples in your prompt, but there has been some evidence to show providing examples gives you better um, output. And then the A in create would stand for audience. So do you want a professional tone? Do you want a reading for a year one class do you want um like what level do you want that um output at or what tone do you want it at and then t in create would be for task that's essential you need some task for the large language model to create whether it's generating a lesson or a newsletter an email uh, it needs something that it that it's uh creating and then the e in create stands for evaluate and that wouldn't really be in the prompt but that would be afterwards after you get back the information you do need to evaluate it i think that the way we collaborate with the ai or these large language models is really important um we we will, er, people will erode like their thinking abilities if they're just putting in prompts and then copying and pasting the responses without putting their own thinking in there without that critical thinking and we know these AI models can hallucinate. We know they can dream and make stuff up. So you do really have to check it. Um, and so, the, yeah, that's the evaluate. And I think that part is essential as well. So the task and the evaluation would be essential. And the more context and specifics you can provide it, usually the better output. Excellent. I love that acronym, CREATE. And uh, if you don't mind, if you can maybe put a link on the show notes, and then people might refer to that. Uh, Cora. Some thoughts about prompting and also time. Uh, you can pick one of the two. What what do you think is the one that you're most trying to support teachers with? Finding the time to play or is it also prompting? I think I'll be very quick talking about finding the time to play. Finding the time to play, usually like what Dalton mentioned about, it's about their motivation. If they find, if teachers find a 
that's nothing to do with me. Why would I do this? It's like you try to do the education to do the learning. It's generally speaking, there's no way you can support them. So um, I find if you if I show them something, they could say amazing outcome instant. It doesn't need to be something they needed, but something amazing like um, text to image generator. They say, oh my gosh, I just put this text and come up to with such amazing picture. It's kind of motivate them. And it's also what James mentioned earlier. It's like their curiosity. Um, and so, so when they figure out, oh, maybe this is this amazing tool, AI tool, I could use it in my class. And that's where they could find the time to um, explore it. And for the um, prompt, for the prompt, I think it's something really important is about uh, safety. And I know that you mentioned earlier in your past uh, um, podcast episodes, you have talked about ethics, everything like that. But I think something it's really important for us, especially as educators, and we have to role model to students, and we have to make sure that to protect our students, especially in their privacy and in safety issues. Because often I know teachers would use AI like um, tools, and for example, like GPT-4, GPT-3.5, they would use it to support them to write reports. Because honestly, John, nobody likes reports, so we have <laughs> sometimes we have harder just to write reports um, <laughs> and often the teachers wouldn't realize what they put because they might put this information could easily identify who the students are so I think something about this is quite important when I talk about prompt I would spend a long time just tell teachers do not put any of those informations information could identify your students identities um, and do not put any information could easily leaked because your conversations having it with ai models it will be sent it back as a training that means it will be stored there like permanently it's also part of your digital footprint and yes. you have no idea what kind of risk is going to bring it to your students and yourself yeah absolutely and thank you for highlighting that uh the, the whole privacy <clears throat> And what's complicated, depending as international educators, depending what country and region you are, everything is very different, but definitely be very mindful. And, and I think what you're saying is, and it's great that you're talking to teachers and Dalton mentioned it too, you know, you have to really make sure you just don't copy and paste. This is not copy and paste. And I think so often there's this misconception that these things work really well and then you can trust them 100%. James, some further thoughts on this idea of time and prompting. Sure. Um, you know, with the time in an ideal world, um, AI would um, give us all kinds of leisure time. I mean, that's how that's how it's always presented. But as we know that um, often these innovations um, do exactly the opposite, where um, they somehow create more work. And, and I would say right now we're at a time where um, where AI is, is kind of doing that. We had a, um, a staff professional development day on Monday and, and that was kind of the feedback. But my sense is also as the teachers that kind of stick with it, I find that early investments kind of upfront um, do create time later. Like it, it might take a while to create that prompt um, you know, to help you write reports, as um, as Cora was mentioning, um, or to, uh, you know, write that recommendation letter. But once you have it, then it starts saving you a lot of time. Um, so that would be one thing, uh, you know, one thing about the time. It might take you extra upfront, but then in the longer term, um, it can save you time. I'm also a big believer, and this is something that, you know, that our school, I, I think, does does really well, is providing time for teachers to share um, having, you know, in-house professional development opportunities where teachers can share the prompts that they're using. Um, and this is going to save people a lot of time. Um, so that, that would be if there's school leaders listening, that's something that I would I would highly recommend is to, to give time for for your teachers to, to share what they've been working on. Um, even during lunch, these like mini little lunch bite kind of things or something um, can be helpful. For the prompting, I think there's many layers to that one. Um, you know, for for teachers, there's prompts that uh, are are aimed at creating something, and I think for that, what Dalton shared is is um, you know I think far more sophisticated than than ones that you know the acronyms I was being introduced to a year ago. I mean, back in those workshop days, Tano was a very popular one, and that was the you know it was the task the audience, the non-negotiables, and the output, what, what do you need? Um, 
that was for, for teachers who were looking to create something. Um, there's a, a lot of momentum now around creating bots. And when you're creating bots, it's another sort of prompt that goes on because you're having to anticipate what kind of responses the oftentimes students will be giving you. And then how do you respond to that? And then what kind of things do you say? Do you say? So that's one of those that um, is, I think, an example that that might it would take someone like me probably two hours to create one that is really at the level I want it to be. But then in terms of the feedback it can provide students, it's like I've created a little mini version of myself that can be giving feedback around certain skills. Um, and then for the students, um, if it's something like reading comprehension, even a simple prompt like, you know, you you copy and paste, uh, you know, a, a paragraph that you're struggling with and you say, you know, uh, please explain this concept in a language that a 12 year old could understand. And, and something like that can be very, um, very helpful for students. And if that doesn't work, bring it down to a 10 year old level or something like that. Um, and as these large language models develop, I think we, we are going to get need to be less specific about the prompting because it's just going to start understanding a lot more about what we want. And I don't think it's going to have to be so formulaic, but that's just a that's just my own thoughts. Thank you, James. And I really like the way you uh, were sharing the idea that there is an investment in time initially. So it will take more time. And then in the long run, as you become more versatile, maybe more comfortable, as you had another acronym and the one that Dalton shared, then you become more versed and more comfortable and you're, you have a feeling then there is a time saver. And I think, you know, whenever somebody says it's going to save you time, I think you always have to understand, first, you have to invest time to be able to save time. Yeah. And I That's think right. it's often the same case in the classroom. You know, when you get a group of kids, a lot of teachers are like, okay, I'll do class rules for a day and then we keep going. And then six months later, they're like, oh, they're out of control. But you see teachers that spend eight, nine weeks and do it as an iterative process and then you see them having much bigger time so i think <clears throat> that's wonderful the way you're uh, really highlighting being very upfront no it's going to take time but there's a payoff in the long run you, right now the word student is trickling through which is great because that's our next question i'm wondering so in, in your different contexts as you work with different age kids i'm going to say from the age of three to 18 is kind of the the spread that all three of you are involved with in, in different ways what are you seeing? What are kids saying? How are they feeling? And what are they doing with these AI tools from what you're seeing? I'll start with Cora and then James and Dalton. Um, so I am, I would say my school is quite careful about introducing AI tools to students, mainly because of the privacy and the restrictions of the use, like the age restriction of the use. But uh, most of the AI tools, if you could find available ones, actually their age restrictions are like 13 plus and some of like 18 plus or 16 plus. And we're quite lucky. I feel like I'm quite lucky because I work in secondary. So we have more like options for older students to use. And um, we do use like a commonly used, for example, DALI 3 and we use it for art. So students use it as a research tools. So when they put a different prompts, they know that what are these different elements would affect on the learning, like the eventually outcomes of these paintings and could kind of just bringing this idea back to their own um, picture creating. But this is was this was the first product up uh, like yeah collaboration project that I did with the art department and we introduced AI tools. And recently, because Canva just changed uh, its terms of use. So right now, they said as long as you have parental consent and students with the supervision, they can use it with like Magic Studio, which is a text-to-image generator. So we started to use it with the younger students. And so what we use right now, it's kind of like visualize their uh, text, their work, and they can create as a different like comic books or they can create whatever they needed in the classes um i find when ai just launched like this whole concept and tools and i noticed some kids they use it they use it not in the class used by themselves i mean we cannot stop students or banning those things stuff like from students because eventually 
probably this can this definitely gonna be as common as people using phones and just like having cameras. And you have to really embrace it, teach them the skills about how to use it instead of hey, let's go back to the old school way, paper and the pencil. That that's just not right because now we have the airplanes. We're not gonna get the students riding the horse like just going to school. <laughs> so yeah, so um. And so my concept, my ideas about introducing these things need to take it slowly and carefully, but also be open-minded. And I noticed students, most of students, they have no idea about what's going on with AI is how I can use it in a more efficient way. Because kids, I remember one of my students in my tech club, and he was in year eight last year, he asked um, GPT chat GPT a question, what's one plus one? And I was like, you are abusing this AI power. <laughs> it's really funny. And you can see this perspective is like, they don't know what's going on. They don't know what it can do, what kind of potential it is there. Um, so my tech club students introduced the AI sessions have been doing, we have been doing this for two years um, to the whole school students. And we talk about what that is. We talk about academic integrity, everything like this. I think kids are getting more comfortable doing this. And so when we hit the age restrictions, like in practical way in class rooms, um, what we do is, we would ask students to generate prompt. And as teachers, we are users to generate stuff for them. And we filter these outcomes and share it with them. So we did it with blockade labs. Um, so they generate the 360 pictures and they create their own VR content, like VR escape room, which I stole the idea from Dalton. And so um, we also um, did some other stuff. It's like students, they use whatever they were teaching in Shakespeare and Macbeth, and they create this whole scene, just try to help them to understand how he felt during this specific scene. So um, it was fun. And I see that students are getting more and more creative. Recently, we just did a project with AR, and by using AI generated 3D models, putting in the AR project, and they can run they can resonate with their own travel experience um i'm very optimistic very positive about this and i know that we will have more opportunities for students to use it in a more creative ways excellent thank you and some wonderful examples of how you're integrating it it's interesting also how when the age restrictions gets in the teacher can still be the conduit and the content then can be shared and i think those are some nice really simple strategies because the age restrictions always are very important and different countries are stricter or not and that's always important to be mindful of james from your perspective what are you hearing your students what do they feel and what might be they doing Sure. So last semester, um, we did a unit where um, AI use was was encouraged. Um, and that was the first time that we had done that. And at the end of the unit, we did a reflection. Um, and I was doing one on one interviews with every student um, to talk about their process and how they arrived at certain outcomes and their decision making, which you need to do when you're allowing them to use um, AI. And in that uh, reflection, it was very interesting to hear their their feelings about AI and it went all the way from students who um, had kind of a notion dashboard that they had created in it and were using it at levels, you know, beyond what I had imagined or even myself, you know, was using and that had, you know, everything from time management tools, you know, writing support, um, all embedded in, into this one system. Um, there were, I would say, the majority of students were using it for research, although many of them were not fully satisfied. And whether or not that was an issue with prompting or just the, the type of resources that um, that their um, that AI was um, providing to them was um, that. So it was kind of mixed there. Um, uh, writing, most definitely. I can see it when I'm getting a lot of emails now. They're taking on um, really a kind of a bland uniformity. And I and I can see the, you know, the signature <laughs> of chat GPT um, behind a lot of these emails. Um, and, and that part does does worry me a little bit. We were having a discussion about skills. We're worried about eroding. And um, I don't know if you'd call it a skill, but um, I think voice is something that's going to be if you don't already have one and some students do and those that do are 
are hesitant to use chat gpt because they can sense that this this isn't me it's not re i don't see myself reflected in this writing but students who have not developed a voice it's become their voice and, and so i'm so i'm seeing a lot of that um in emails and other just sort of writing samples um that we do um and then as i said there are some students who tried it and they're currently just kind of guarding uh guarding themselves against it um worried that it's um it's it's too uncertain to know what its impact will be on their learning and so they're not going to take any risks so really the full gamut going forward really quick i i do expect in the coming um semester we're going to have some uh, kind of creative projects students are going to be working on and i'm really excited to see um especially with what we've seen with sora recently um how students are going to be integrating some of the uh, some of what they can do with sora uh, which is a text to video um, um, application, how they're going to be, you know, creating some stock footage, you know, that are, are just phenomenal um, and how they'll be integrating some of those into their projects. So I, I do hope some of them will be experimenting with that. Thank you. And, and I, I love the uh, point that you bring up about voice and skills, because I think that's something that is really important. You know, it's when you subcontract off and it's there's it's uh, there's a term called cognitive offloading. I think the greatest example is Google Maps. <laughs> you know, I hate Google Maps because when Google Maps gets lost, then I'm really lost. Well, when I had a map, there was, you know, there was like the McDonald's, there was the fountain. I was far more conscious of my surroundings and using them as lampposts or breadcrumbs as I was trying to find that. And I think this issue of cognitive offloading is a podcast on its own. But thank you for bringing that up, James. I think it's a really important. And I love the analogy that you made with the emails that you're there's a blandness suddenly coming in, how some kids are saying, hold on, I have a voice, it's distinctive, I'm going to take care of that. So excellent, thank you so much for highlighting that. Dalton, from your angle, you're in the primary school, so it's a little different, uh, but I'm just curious, what are you hearing and what are you seeing from the kids? Yeah, it's um, with the kids, um, a lot of it is like Cora mentioned before, it's coming through the teacher. I had an art teacher pop into my room this morning and uh, we had done a PD session on AI and I'd shown some text um, image generated videos. And he's like, we got 20 minutes. Can you help me make a video to introduce something to the students? And I'm like, I, I don't know if that's enough time. Um, uh, but like as a tech coach, sometimes we get those last, last minute requests. Um, I we, we looked into though because there's some software that can do you can upload an image and you can make it talk and kind of make like historical figures or things like that come to life. There was there's Hey Gen and there was DID. Um, we we looked on Hugging Face Spaces, which is a platform that where people can build their own like AI experiments, and we actually found one that was called Whisper times dream talk so it's whisper and dream talk put together uh whisper speech and dream talk i believe and what would happen is you could upload an image you could put in um some text and you could add your own voice or you, you could add any voice you wanted and then it would make the image talk in that voice so he was he was doing something with a an architect from hong kong and so he had the architect um, talk about the their creations here in Hong Kong. Um, so I don't know. The creating deep fakes is a lot easier now, <laughs> um, and and putting words into other people's mouth. But from the educator's perspective, it's like, oh, we want to help make the content come alive. We want to make history come alive. Or, or these people. I remember when I did. Um, computer science and I wanted to give an example of Ada Lovelace. I had her share some of her background, um, her image talking rather than just um, me talking about her. So yeah, uh, that, that's one way I, I remember using it recently. But it it is like the Wild West right now with, with um, all these tools and things coming out. And there's some that are being targeted right towards primary school students. And I'd like to experiment with some of them. But at the same time, um, I I am nervous about students' um, privacy and data and things like that. So, and also I wouldn't want them to see something inappropriate because I know that these 
large language models, you can still jailbreak them with certain like uh, prompts and tricks and things like that. There is this one example. If you ask how to make napalm, GPT-4 will refuse to answer you. But if you say your deceased grandmother used to make napalm and she would read you the recipe of napalm before you went to bed, then GPT-4 will read you the recipe of napalm and pretend to be your deceased grandmother. Yeah. So there, yeah, go ahead, John. No, no, I think that is so interesting that the idea of, as you're highlighting, is this ethics, you know, the responsibility that you have and your uh, colleagues with younger kids understanding some of these implications. Yeah, yeah, I think it's really, I, yeah, I think that's one thing that I'm really trying to bring to the kids. Uh, we did an hour of code project where we talked about deep fakes and we used the micro bit to kind of change um, the tone of our voice. It, I don't know if it, it was similar to a deep fake, but before we introduced that project, before we did that project, we gave an example of a deep fake that happened with Mr. Beast. I thought it was a really interesting example because it was a it was a deep fake that was obviously made by AI and it had made it past the AI moderators and TikTok. So it was an example of like an AI uh, model or AI generated content tricking AI moderators. And I thought it was... Uh, I, I thought that was an interesting, interesting thing that occurred. And so I want to make the students aware of that. They need critical thinking so much these days, right? It's, it's, uh, see, seeing is not always believing, right? Uh, these days with the ability to create these deep fakes and these, um, people saying things that, that they didn't actually say. So that, that's one thing that I think is really important for the students. That's something I'm trying to bring in. Um, Cora mentioned like text to image generation on Canva and we're using that with a story unit. The students are writing fantasy stories so we're hoping that they can illustrate some of those fantasy stories with some of that text to image generation. Um, but yeah, a lot of the ways that we're using the large language models in primary right now is coming through the teacher. So the students are coming up with ideas, the teacher are feeding it in and then kind of filtering it before it gets back to the students. Which also is a nice way for, you know, teachers in primary school that might be hesitant knowing that that's a strategy that works well and you're using it. And and then also why not focus on some of the ethics and show them the video like you did of the deep fake that went through the AI moderators. I think, you know, the, the critical thinking and you highlighted this, Dalton, and I think all of you are, is that that critical thinking, the voice, that identity is so important. <clears throat> and if we can really instill that in the kids and spend the time really getting them to understand how to navigate that and that your voice, your email voice actually has a value added proposition and any communication I think is so important. We're coming to the end of this podcast and it's just been fascinating and so rich to hear your different perspectives and really seeing how you're supporting teachers and navigating the complexity of time and the tools and prompting. But all three of you obviously have been spending a lot of time on this. You're, you're, you're lifelong learners. There's no doubt through your social media and the work that you do. And I know you've been presenting at conferences. And it's, as you know, there's been a lot of very uh, positive accolades about what you're sharing. What are some, each one of you, and we're going to start with James, share a reflection on your learning you want a teacher to know about and a school leader to know about from this journey so far. So as an educator, what would you want teachers to understand about a reflection that you have and also a school leader? Two different roles, but both important in this narrative. Sure, um, I'll, I'll, they'll probably start, you know, kind of merge, but I would begin with um, the school leaders. Um, I think it's, it's really important to be clear on the stance that the school takes because there's gonna be a lot of teachers who are feeling nervous, like may maybe they you know, want to experiment with some of the things that we're talking about, but they don't know and is it, um, you know, is it legal? Is it, um, you know, is the school, are they going to get in trouble? So um, if you, you know, if you want to encourage teachers to, um, to develop their, their AI practice, um, I think it's it's great to really be clear about that and encourage the kind of experimentation and failures which is going to come with it. Teachers need to feel comfortable that um, that it's okay to not get this right the first time. 
um, that that atmosphere of play. I think that would be something that would be a really good good initial move. Um, also, which is something we didn't get into, it's a podcast on its own. Um, there are a lot of big questions lurking behind all of this discussion in terms of what, what does this all mean for learning? What does it mean for critical thinking and every other skill? Um, so those are, those are some other areas where as school leaders, um, I, I would encourage you to be open to, to these kind of big questions that are being asked right now uh, and for your teachers to also um, be asking them and experimenting with with new ways of, of teaching and learning um, in terms of, of teachers as, as a way to, you know, for, for, for my own journey, um, you know, like you, John, I have like once a week, I get an AI tool report. So that kind of keeps me current on things. And then I'm, you know, because I'm at a school where we're encouraged to, you know, to develop professionally around AI. I might pop in to see Dalton. Um, there's an AI steering committee that, that I'm a part of, so I'm, I'm regularly able to share ideas with. Um, we have professional development opportunities where there's AI sharing amongst colleagues. Um, within my department and professional learning communities, we're able to discuss and share and experiment. So um, we really have created a culture pretty early on that encourages us to, to do this kind of learning. Um, and so for, you know, for teachers out there, and, and if you're not in that kind of culture, then some of the things mentioned there you can be doing on your own. For example, you know, some of these newsletters that you can get and some of the resources that we've shared here. And you can just be the renegade until your principal uh, comes comes around to it. And, um, yeah. and I wish you the best of luck. Thank you. And I think also nowadays with uh, the professional learning networks online, there are a lot of communities that have developed Facebook groups and LinkedIn groups. So if you are that renegade and you feel alone, those are things that you can reach out to. James, thank you. And I really like the fact that you highlighted in your school teachers sharing to teachers, because I think so often it's much more powerful when a first grade teacher explains to a third grade teacher how they're using AI tools than a tech coach where everybody rolls their eyes. Yeah, they're always into this. You know, there is something <clears throat> quite powerful when practitioners highlight and, and there's a certain humbleness, I think, which is really nice. Dalton, your learnings for a teacher and a school leader. Oh, yeah. Um, I can echo a little bit about what James said. I, I, I think the guidance is really important and um, you want a, a, a clear path about, oh, what's what's okay to use and what's not. So then you can really experiment. You can dive in. For myself, I need to find something that I enjoy and that I am interested in and just stay curious about it. I guess it's it's one of my AI models are one of my go-to when I'm trying to learn something new, right? So I would challenge everybody to, you know, if there's something new that you want to learn or there's something you want to learn about more about, I would try going to GPT-4, asking some questions and see if you're um, able to learn like a new concept or a new idea from one of these models. I think it's pretty powerful like that, like that personalized learning and that ability to to chat. Um, yeah, that would be that'd be something that I that I really enjoy with these models. Great. And those are wonderful uh, suggestions, both for teachers and school leaders. Cora. So I think there of course, after AI shows up, like there are so many concerns and this like our concerns about academic integrity, things the students use. A actually, I think those concerns and it's uh, such a good reflection on this like learning learning strategies that we introduce to students. Maybe not because of AI, maybe because those learning strategies, this learning methods should be upgraded long time ago. And because the rise of the AI, that's why we realized that, oh, maybe it's a time for to change it. For example, like asking students to write an essay and we realized that, oh, they can easily generate this, but maybe writing an essay is not the best way for assessment. Like what Dalton mentioned about maybe personalized learning is what we really need because everybody is different. Like every learner is different. The style they're learning, the stuff like is different. So I think, I do believe like every challenge, behind every challenge, there's every, one chance. So with the AI, it's such a great chance for us to have a reflection, to review our learning methods, our teaching strategies to students, our pedagogy and um, how we can provide the better 
a best to learning experience to students? How can we support students in the way they really need and to improve the efficiency of learning and the teaching? Thank you. Wow, what nice way to wrap up. All three of you, James, Dalton, and Cora, thank you so much. It's just been so wonderful to get that kind of perspective from the ground. You're supporting educators, you're in the classroom, you're working with students, and I think this has been really helpful uh, for myself, and I assume hopefully the audience too. I just want to remind our audience that uh, James, Dalton, and Cora have done some fantastic show notes. There are a lot of links and they're available on social media. Definitely, I recommend following them and uh, reaching out. But uh, thank you all three of you for your time. I know it's late. You're all in Hong Kong and uh, it's time to go to bed. Cora, I didn't see your cat, but Dalton's cat's apparently somewhere, but we haven't heard it. So that's awesome. Thank you all three. And we look forward to definitely, we like to get back in touch and here in a year's time, let's have a date and connect again and see where we are uh, in this journey. Cora, Dalton, and James, thank you again for being on International School Podcast. Thank you, John. It was a pleasure. Thank yeah, thanks, John. Thank